SCP-6265 The Royal Nursery I don't think it's a big secret that I'm personally a fan of the way that SCP authors can take various myths and legends and recontextualize them to slot into the SCP universe. Gods, folklore, cryptids, and mythologies have appeared numerous times in the SCP database, taking concepts that are old and familiar and making them into new and exciting anomalies. SCP-6265 is another one of these types of anomalies, taking a well-trodden set of myths and twisting it to fit into the scientific and fantastical world of SCP. Let's take a look. SCP-6265 is a massive underground facility located several kilometers underneath the Pompon Forest in Brittany, France. It's accessible through several hidden entrances embedded in the forest's undergrowth, five of which have so far been discovered. Research indicates that the facility is an artifact of Camelot, an anomalous nation which existed in the British Isles and surrounding territories during the 5th and 6th centuries. The facility primarily consists of a winding network of tunnels around a central point, with security doors and cameras spread throughout the complex. Despite the great length of time since its estimated construction, it appears to still be active and operating, with fully functioning lights and automatic doors. The means by which the facility is powered is still unclear, with numerous cables running from the complex into the dirt and vegetation above it. Evidence suggests that the facility was constructed around a large chamber directly in its center, visible through several sturdy portholes. This chamber appears to be filled with a translucent orange liquid, and it's been determined that the liquid possesses potent life-extending and nestic properties. Floating within the chamber is a female figure, perpetually in a fetal position, with a long black cord connecting to the base of her neck from one of the chamber's inner walls. This figure identifies as Guinevere, and is capable of communicating through text via the monitors present throughout the facility. She appears to be cognizant of all events within the complex that are in view of security cameras, and is also capable of manipulating the facility via remote use of security doors and other mechanisms. In addition, she has demonstrated the ability to form highly advanced incubators out of the walls of the complex. So far, she's been cooperative with personnel, and has freely volunteered information regarding the facility's history and purpose. According to her, the facility was constructed as a production facility for genetically engineered human beings by the Camelot monarchy. These humans were supposedly generated using the ruling king's genetic material as a base, with further alterations directed and applied by Guinevere on a case-by-case -case basis. Guinevere suggests that these requested applications could vary greatly from the common purpose of war to more specialized areas of technical repair and diplomacy. Following the discovery and initial observation of Guinevere, an interview was conducted via text, led by Foundation researcher Maris. Guinevere states that a great deal of time has passed since she last received visitors, and asks if the world still follows the turning light of Stilino. Maris replies that she's not familiar with an entity by that name, and asks if Guinevere can describe it for her. Guinevere says that Stilino is the day and the night, and the transition process between the two. He is steel, and industry, and the light of wisdom. He constructed the world in perfect unity, with all components in their proper ratios. He is the Almighty Father and Administrator of this reality. He is the Divine Apex, the machine made perfect, the metal star that births mankind. In other words, he is Mekane, the Broken God. 
Maris remarks on what a passionate description that was, but notes that this deity is still worshipped by some, though it's called the Broken God now. Guinevere, however, says that the heresy persists then, but says that that's a story for another day. Maris moves on, stating that, according to Guinevere, her kingdom's religion was based around worship of the mechanical, of steel and industry. When they first initiated communication with her, she indicated that this facility was designed to gestate and produce human beings. They're having trouble seeing how those two things match up. Guinevere replies that humans are machines constructed from meat, and the distinction is irrelevant. Maris then asks if that's the same logic that led to her imprisonment here, following up by asking if Guinevere is actually imprisoned or not. She replies that she is not, as she chose this situation for herself. It was the hope of any child of Camelot to be of use to the almighty king, chosen of Stilano. Four tried before her, but she alone survived integration. A king is nothing without a dynasty, but their monarch was unable, as he had given too much of his body to his divine patron. Guinevere says to think of her mind as a single cog in a great mechanism. It is her task to imagine the king's children, to direct the machinery to create what is needed for the task at hand. It is a task she has performed for many years now. Maris says that that means she's been here for more than a thousand years, and asks when will her work stop. Guinevere replies that the work does not stop, as she has devoted her body and soul and her eternity to her king forevermore. That is her happiness, and the king will someday return when the nation has need of him once again. She tells Maris to feel free to walk these halls, as she's glad of company, and if she has any questions, feel free to ask. For now, though, let her sleep and dream of the future. Throughout exploration of the facility, several used incubators have been found in various areas. It's believed that these incubators were previously utilized to gestate and birth humans, with monitors next to them logging information regarding their former occupants. One incubator discovered on a wall near the entrance to the facility was only roughly the size of a human fist, compared to the rest which are human-sized. The name is listed as Gwydre, the purpose is experiment, the aspect is sun, and the status is deceased. Under a section titled Visage, it reads, A small and wretched thing. He twitches meekly. Through his sacrifice, a dynasty is born. Guinevere seems upset about Gwydra, and says that it had to be confirmed that the royal nursery would actually function. She was directed to create a test case, a simple and short-lived thing. Long-term stability was not a concern, and thus he was born dying. She sang to him as he passed. Another incubator was discovered in a hallway above Guinevere's chamber, protruding from the ceiling. The name is listed as Hilda, the purpose is engineer, the aspect is daughter, the status is deceased. As for the visage, it reads, her body is long and lithe, so as to slip and weave between the organs of mighty war machines. Her head lacks hair that could snag, and her eyes peer unburdened by the dark. Her skull swells against the pressure of her brain. Her bones are flexible like water, and the fluids shed from her skin make her shine in the sunlight. She forgets nothing. Upon asking about this one, Guinevere says that the army of Camelot was the wonder of the age. Arthur led the charge, his armor intersecting with him and sustaining his life, white plates glinting in the sun. 
His augmented steed galloped with such speed that it could run along the water. She becomes distracted for a moment in reminiscence, and then says that behind Arthur flew the hundred banners of Stilano, crested by the mighty war machines. These were walking castles, sufficient to crush villages beneath their feet. Nothing could stop the march of Camelot, nothing could stop the march of progress, but occasionally the march would slow. A perfect machine would never break down, but even their mighty engines were hollow imitations of Stilano's glory. That in itself, however, opened up a new spectacle. Like worker ants, the engineers would pour forth and begin their repairs. They would writhe their ways between gears and cogs, their slippery bodies granting them great speed as they worked their way through to the damaged parts. It took only minutes at a time for the error to be corrected, but no hands would be faster than those of Hilda. No problem was beyond her brilliance, no obstacle beyond her reach. Guinevere calls her her daughter, and then says that they never came back to visit. Another incubator was found in a hallway underneath Guinevere's chamber, protruding from a wall in approximately 15 feet tall. The glass of the incubator appeared to have been smashed from the inside. The name is listed as Amr. The purpose was Destroyer. The aspect was Sun. The status is deceased, and the visage reads, His hair is flowing black and coats his body like a shawl. His skull pushes up before his face in the manner of a mask or helmet. He was born diminutive as an infant, but decides his own size with arbitrary passion. At times he is six feet tall, sometimes nine, sometimes twelve, sometimes fifteen. When he roars, the land shakes. To Camelot, he is a titan worthy of admiration. To Camelot's enemies, he is the ogre of a nightmare house. Guinevere explains that many times after Arthur had accepted Stilano as the father and administrator of this world, he would face rebellions from the blind. At first, these were worshippers of the obsolete divinities and were easily crushed with steel and flame. But as the truth soaked into the land, the nature of these adversaries changed. Even their notion of Stilano was but a simple interpretation of the absolute mechanism. It's no surprise that alternate interpretations would arise, and the rebels that plagued Camelot for many years followed a rusted, shattered god a wretched, malfunctioning thing that was the source of all human misery. They believed that it was their duty to repair this dying deity, so as to perfect this flawed universe. Maris remarks that she doesn't see how that required war, and Guinevere says that she didn't either, at first, but the king is never mistaken. Camelot was founded on Stilano's supremacy, and to cast aspersions on that is to deny Camelot itself. Traitors cannot be suffered to live, but the rebels were sometimes formidable. Excellent soldiers were needed for battle, and although augmentation of the body sufficed for a time, eventually a better class of warrior was necessary. Amr was born to destroy Camelot's enemies, and he smashed fortresses, burnt villages, and devoured mighty knights. Once that was accomplished, there was no further need for him to exist. Arthur slew him, and the land was broken from their clash. Guinevere asked that his bones be returned, but Arthur could not spare the men, as there was a great deal to be done, and Guinevere says that she understood the decision. A fourth incubator was discovered in a massive room located directly above Guinevere's chamber, elevated slightly by a pedestal, but standing only four feet tall. The name is listed as Arkved. The purpose is beloved, the aspect is child, and the status is deceased. 
The visage reads, Their hair is white and billows down to the ground like snow. Their features are fair and heavenly, so as to inspire devotion. Their voice is song, so as to inspire the people's love. Their four eyes shine black with cosmic wisdom. At times they choose to float above the ground. When they spread their four arms wide and preach, the whole world must listen. It is required of them. Guinevere says that Arkved was a fine child, and that the final product achieved the brief perfectly. She could not hope for more pride as a mother. Maris asks what this brief was, as their purpose is listed as beloved, and wonders what use that is in a mechanical kingdom. Guinevere says that it is vital, as just as machines need fuel, humans need morale. There is nothing more inspiring than a being of beauty and wisdom to pledge your sword to. Armies would charge to their deaths for Arkved's smile, and there was not a soul in Camelot that could deny Arkved's requests, except for Ancelaus. He was the chief engineer of this place, before the fall of the kingdom, and before the foundation assumed those duties. He held certain affections for Guinevere, and since it did not impact his work, she saw no need to dissuade him. Her decision, however, was incorrect, as at some point he acquired the notion that her duty was something she required to be rescued from. He took steps to sabotage this facility and to betray the king, poisoning the mind of her final born in that effort. He thought revolution was the ideal way to give her her supposed freedom. Maris asks if the final born was Arkved, but Guinevere says of course not. Arkved was always the king's favorite. But as she begins to state what happens when they fell, she falters and says that she will not speak of this further. Another incubator was discovered in a small room located far below Guinevere's chamber, in a separate section accessible via ladder. The room itself was behind numerous sealed doors that had to be breached via drill. The incubator is marked with the name of Mordred. The purpose is Air. The aspect is Bastard. And the status is Living. The visage reads, His hair is short and dark across his head, like that of a bear. In his right hand he holds the killing light, and from his left he births the dread sword Clarent. He is four-eyed and seven-fingered. When he roars he shakes the earth, but he does not roar often, as he is of the serpent's kind. The king's blood is still upon his blade. He will know that you have found this. Guinevere explains that this is Mordred the Red Stepped, and it's said that he is the lowest scum in all the world, and he brings the end of days. Maris asks what she thinks of him, and Guinevere asks in return what she would think of the person who ran her beloved through who destroyed her kingdom, who tore down her world. Maris responds that it would depend on the reason, and Guinevere agrees. Later, new advances were made in the full mapping of the facility. By clearing heavy amounts of vegetation that had grown through one of the complex's walls, personnel were able to gain access to a previously unknown secondary entrance to the complex. During exploration of this secondary entrance, heavily decayed human remains were recovered. This corpse was clad in a highly advanced, albeit decayed, form of mechanical armor, and dating indicates that they likely died thousands of years prior. When located, the corpse was still holding a steel tablet engraved with hundreds of rows of small characters. These characters correspond to no known language, 
but they were presented to Guinevere. She responded with, Production order received. O oh my king, O oh my king, O oh blessed Bedivere, your mission complete. O oh my king, O oh my king, Camelot rises. The following day, a new incubation chamber emerged from the wall directly outside of Guinevere's chamber. Its name is listed as Arthur. Its purpose is king, its aspect is father, and its status is growing. The visage simply reads, Magnificent. So, for this SCP's canon, the Broken God was worshipped by an ancient kingdom led by a man named Arthur, who possessed advanced technology and industries. They didn't believe their god was broken, however but rather that it was a perfect machine, whereas a rebellion rose up that would eventually become the Church of the Broken God. King Arthur could not have children of his own, having become too augmented, and so this facility was created to artificially birth new humans as his children, directed by Guinevere. All of the children's names come from Arthurian legend, as well as Guinevere being King Arthur's wife in myth whereas here she was simply appointed a motherly role. The characterization of each of the children is taken from disparate sources of Arthurian legends, but the entire article is certainly an homage to the myths, with a unique biopunk twist. The Foundation doesn't really stand to gain a great deal by allowing the rebirth of an ancient religious warlord, so I can't imagine they let it go through, but you never know. It's always interesting though to see how various myths and legends can be taken and reshaped in the SCP universe in new and unique ways. <laughs>